Shane here with the University of Ultrasonics. Uh, this will be the third installment of my Digital Revolution video series, and this time we're going to talk about timing fidelity, and we'll calculate uh, time of flight measurement errors that we may encounter when using various digitization frequencies and sampling rates. Uh, if you missed episodes one and two, check those out first before watching this one. I'll leave some links up here so you can find them. And when you're all caught up, uh, meet me back here so we can level up those UT skills. In previous installments, we covered Nyquist theory and basic digitization principles. We discussed the relationship between digitization frequency, uh, intervals between samples, wave period, and sampling rate. We also spoke about the importance of maintaining both amplitude and timing fidelities. Uh, we even touched on the fact that in certain cases, the codes may give guidelines that pertain to these. Uh, this time around, we will focus on timing fidelity. Uh, we'll also calculate margins of error and compare our findings to a few different code scenarios. So for us, uh, timing error and fidelity, that's what we're interested in today. What that really means is how close a sample lands to the location of the peak, uh, given a worst case scenario. On that, the next video, we will calculate amplitude fidelity, which is how closely the digital amplitude represents the uh, analog amplitude. Um, as you can see here, those are two completely different parameters. They often get lumped together as one, but, but that's a mistake. They're two completely different things. Um, we'll cover that later. Uh, worst case scenario for accuracy always occurs when a peak is centered between two consecutive samples as seen right here. So for the first scenario that we're gonna think about, um, I'm considering a five megahertz probe and a 10 megahertz digitization frequency which would result in two samples per period that are spaced equally down the length of the cycle. Uh, we could also call this the Nyquist sampling limit. Best case scenario here, we get a sample on both the positive and negative peaks, uh, meaning amplitude and timing fidelities would have been preserved. Um, we can calculate the sample rate to show that we have two samples per period, and we can prove the, the interval between samples is around 50% of the overall period. The problem with Nyquist, um, those samples could occur anywhere and it's no guarantee that we're going to find the peak. In this case, uh, we shifted the samples a quarter cycle to the left, which gave us a worst case scenario in which those samples fell on the equilibrium axis of the cycle. And we missed both the peaks, resulting in no signal detection. Uh, notice how that analog peak is uh, directly centered between those two samples. This is where we're going to experience our greatest error between the location of our digital samples and the location of the analog peaks. When a peak is centered between samples, we lose the timing and amplitude accuracy as seen here. Everything above that blue line would be lost. Um, this would be a worst case scenario. Uh, since we're dividing the period by two, the interval between samples is going to represent 50% of that cycle. Divide that by two again, and you'll see how close in percentage the sample is to the actual location of the peak. So in this case, we're within 25% of the location of the peak. So we've got a 25% timing error, but we've lost the amplitude. We've lost the signal, right? We're not within 25% of the amplitude of the peak. Uh, we'll have to cover amplitude fidelity on that next video. So let's think about a scenario here. Um, five megahertz probe, L wave exam on carbon steel. Um, the wavelength would be about 46,000, so about 1.2 millimeters. 25% uh, error would be about 11 or 12 thousandths of an inch, uh, 0.3 millimeters. Um, your measurements, your error with pitch catch or pulse echo, they could vary just a little bit. For the next scenario, we're going to consider using a 5 megahertz probe and a 15 megahertz digitizing frequency, which would give us three samples per period. Uh, notice how the way I drew this, uh, the first sample landed on the peak of the positive, but the peak of the negative displacement was missed and it was kind of centered between the second and third samples. And if I shift those samples over to the left a little bit, well, now the third sample is directly on the peak of the negative, but I've missed the positive peak. It's now centered between the first and second sample. So using a limited number of samples per period, like three, it's impossible to accurately locate both the positive and negative peaks. That's why we tend to use more samples. Uh, when a peak is centered between samples, we lose the timing accuracy 
and the amplitude information of that peak as seen here. Uh, everything above that blue line would be lost. So again, this is our worst case scenario. Um, since we divided the period by three, the interval between samples is going to represent about 33% of that cycle. Divide that again by two, and we can show that we're within 16.5% of the location of the peak. So we've got about a 16% error and about an 83.5% timing accuracy or timing fidelity. And uh, if we think about the same scenario as before, we've got a 5 megahertz probe uh, doing an L-wave exam on carbon steel. That 16.5% error is going to equate to about eight thousandths of an inch. Um, not the end of the world for uh, timing fidelity, but again, amplitude fidelity will be a little bit different and we'll have to cover that later. Uh, for this next scenario, 5 megahertz probe, 20 megahertz digitizing frequency. This would give us four samples per period. Uh, notice the way I made this model, none of the samples actually align with the peaks. Where a sample lines up on a cycle, it's random and impossible to predict. There's no guarantees that you're ever going to find the actual peak of the signal. But the closer we get, the better we get. Uh, the, the max error always occurs when the peak is centered between samples and, and we lose that timing amplitude uh, and amplitude information. Uh, note that the blue line in this case is closer to the peak than it was in previous examples. Uh, more samples equals less error. Uh, since we're dividing the period by four, the interval between samples is going to represent, say, about 25% of the cycle. Divide that again by two, and we can see that we're within 12.5% of the location of the peak. So we've got a 12.5% amplitude, or, or excuse me, timing error. And if we think about the same scenario as before, 5 megahertz exam on uh, L-Wave and carbon steel, that 12.5% error would equate to about five or six thousandths of an inch, so about 0.15 millimeters, getting closer. And coincidentally, four times the probe frequency is the minimum digitizing frequency allowed for TOFT in ASME Section 5, Article 4. For the next scenario, we'll consider using a 5 meg probe and a 25 megahertz digitizing frequency, which would result in five samples per period uh, spaced equally down the length of the cycle. Uh, this is often re referred to as ideal minimum sampling. Uh, notice in this scenario, none of my samples aligned with the peak, but my second and fourth samples got pretty close. Here we're showing the peak centered between the samples again. This is our worst case scenario. Everything above the blue line is lost. The blue line is closer to the peak than it was in previous examples because the more samples we get, the less error. Um, since we're dividing the period by five, the interval between samples is going to represent about 20% of the overall cycle. Divide that again by two, and you can see that we're going to be within about 10% of the location of the peak. So 10% error, 90% accuracy. Uh, we often say that uh, five samples per period will keep us within about 10% of the original analog waveform. Uh, that might be true regarding timing fidelity. The worst case, it, it ensures that no sample is any greater than 10% away from the location of the peak. This is not true regarding amplitude fidelity, and I will prove that to you on the next video. And if we consider the same scenario as before, 5 meg probe, L-wave carbon still. That 10% error is going to equal about four or five thousandths of an inch, so about 0.12 millimeters. Um, really small, right? We're getting really close. Uh, five times the probe frequency is uh, actually the uh, minimum digitizing frequency allowed for encoded phase durée in ASME Section 5, Article 4. For the next scenario, uh, we're just going to blow it out of the water. We're going to think about a 5 meg probe and we're going to use a 100 megahertz digitizing frequency, which would give us 20 samples per period. Uh, by the way, 100 megahertz is the default digitization frequency in many of today's phase dray instruments. And that's before any compression or subsampling or points quantity. We're going to talk about that later, too. The more samples you collect, the closer and closer you get to the peak, uh, no matter where the samples are along that waveform the better your timing and amplitude fidelities are going to be. Uh, here we're showing the peak centered between the samples. Again, we lose anything above that blue line. 
Uh, but notice the blue line is much closer to the peak than previous examples. More samples always means less error. Um, since we're dividing the period by 20 this time, the interval between samples is going to represent about 5% of the cycle. Divide that again by 2 and you'll see how close we get. Uh, in this case, we're within 2.5% of the location of the peak. So 2.5% error, 97.5% uh, timing accuracy or timing fidelity. And if we think about the same scenario like we did earlier, 5 meg, L wave, carbon still, 2.5% error along that wavelength is going to equate to about one thousandth of an inch, right? So this would be super accurate, really high resolutions, but it might be overkill for some situations. This is far exceeding most of our code requirements. Uh, more samples is going to equal larger file sizes and slower scanning speeds. So why would a manufacturer set 100 megahertz or even 125 as a default or a max digitization frequency? Uh, simple. To make sure that we can achieve ideal sample rates with any of the probe frequencies that are, that are compatible with the instrument. The higher the probe frequency, the higher the digitization rate needs to be. So this leads us to our last scenario here. A 20 megahertz probe with a 100 megahertz digitization frequency. This would give us our five samples per period. We would achieve ideal minimum sampling. Like I said earlier, 100 megahertz might be overkill for certain situations. Um, some instruments do allow you to directly adjust the digitization frequency. Other instruments allow you to adjust what we call a net digitizing frequency via a process called compression. Uh, you might be more familiar with other terms for compression like points quantity or subsampling. Uh, I will cover that in a later video. It's a really important subject. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up for this installment. Uh, the next episode will cover amplitude fidelity as it relates to digitizing an analog A scan. Um, we'll break that down and calculate margins of error just like we did for timing fidelity. But as you can see, it is going to be a little bit more complicated. Uh, eventually, I'll get into amplitude fidelity as it relates to TFM, but that's another subject. So stay tuned for that. Um, if you like the content, be sure to hit subscribe down there and follow my channel. Uh, take care and we'll catch up real soon.